Everybody, as they say, the best goes last. And here we are to talk about testing Android apps at scale. My name is Stefan Linsler, and I'm a software engineer at Google. And with me backstage is Vishal Sedia, who's also a software engineer at Google. So at Google, we believe in diversity and inclusion. And we build our products for everyone. But for us developers, this means we also have to test for everyone. So let me tell you a little bit how we develop and test software at Google. But before I start, I want to talk a little bit about the scale that we do Android development here at Google. We have about 100 plus Android apps. This includes all the billion user apps, shots such as Google Photos, Maps, YouTube, Gmail, Search. We have a combined 2 billion lines of code. And we run 20,000 Android builds every single day. And we have a staggering 27 million test invocations per day. So how do we create these high quality apps? And how do we maintain this quality over such a long time? I think one of the key things here is our engineering culture. A typical developer workflow at Google looks a little bit like this. We have a strong code reviewing culture. Code reviews are very, very thorough. And before you can actually submit your change or pull request, you have to get at least reviewed by one of your peers. Another important thing is that all development happens at head, and everything is built from source. And we have a large monorepo, which allows us to easily search for code, reuse code, but it also allows us to keep the repo healthy by sending so uh, called large scale changes. We also have a very strong testing culture. At Google, if you have a change, you have to have tests. And even more importantly, all of those tests have to pass before you submit your change. To run tests, we use a large scale distributed CI system, which does not only run your tests, but also all of the tests from code that depends on your change. Another thing that is very unique about Google is that we have a strong <clears throat> engineering productivity culture. So that means we have dedicated teams that only work on infrastructure tools and APIs to make developers productive. We are part of such a team. And we have been working on testing Android apps or Android app testing um, at Google. So I want to <clears throat> take you a walk down memory lane, what we have done at Google to scale Android testing. So in about 2011, a lot of teams at Google actually started to build for Android because Android was becoming more and more popular. So at the time, they were just using the standard tool chain. They were using Ant to build their apps, and they were using Eclipse as an editor. But with a growing number of teams, we also added support to our internal build system. One of the problems that became obvious very early on was the need for scalable testing. And so we actually started off very simple by building a small host site test runner that would run on the host. And in fact, it was just a JUnit 3 test suite that would literally scan an APK, list the tests, and give it to our instrumentation test runner that was running on the device to execute the test. Once we had that, we actually built it into our continuous integration system. One of the key decisions that we made very early on was to use emulators, we called them virtual devices, to run tests at scale. Because obviously, it makes more sense, because you can scale a data center, but you can probably not scale a USB hub so easily. So we wrote this little Python script, probably just 20 lines of code, and I'm sure many of you have been there, that boots up an emulator for us that allows us to run the tests and shut it down afterwards. So while we were working on infrastructure, our engineers actually started, started to write tests. And they wrote a lot of them. A key problem here was especially around functional UI testing. And as many of you will remember, in the early days, you only had the low-level framework APIs. You had activity monitor to track activities. You had instrumentation run on UI thread or the infamous wait until idle sync 
And even though these methods, uh, these APIs, were, were easy to use, developers struggled a lot writing uh, reliable UI tests. And at the time, we thought, OK, maybe we could find something better. And we actually found that in a community with Robotium. So we brought Robotium into Google, and it improved things. And we used it for about a year until the end of 2012. But it had its own issues with the API surface. And it didn't solve one of our key issues, which was synchronization. And that's when we started to work on Espresso, because we wanted a framework that was easy to use for developers, but more importantly, was hiding all the complexity of instrumentation testing from the developer. So at that point, we kind of had a decent setup for instrumentation tests, but we still had to solve the unit testing problem. Because as you remember, at the time, all of your unit tests, you usually ran them on the device. But that is expensive, and they tend to be slower than running on the JVM. So again, we reached for a solution that the community had already built at the time, which was Roboelectric. And Roboelectric allowed our developers to do fast, iterative, local development. And it's actually still one of the most popular frameworks for unit testing within Google. So in 2014, we actually had built a lot of experience in testing APIs. But we were seeing that the community was struggling you know, from the same problems that we did. That's why we decided to bundle all of our libraries together in the Android testing support library, which then quickly became the default library for developers to write instrumentation tests. Fast forward to today, we just launched Android X Test 1.0. It's not only our first stable release, it's also the first time where we ship unified APIs that allow you to write tests once and run them anywhere. And by the way, we just achieved a major milestone here at Google. We now run 10 billion unit and instrumentation tests every year on our infrastructure. So looking back at those seven years, what would we do differently? There's a couple of things I want to mention here. So we would probably design for any build system. We made some key decisions very early on that tightly coupled us to Google's internal build system. But it quickly became a problem, because even at Google, not everybody's using Google's internal build system. And we weren't able to share our, uh, our host-side infrastructure with them, but also not with the community, and we couldn't open source it. Similarly, we didn't build some of the tools that we've built weren't cross-platform. So they only worked on Linux, but not Mac and Windows. Another thing that we would probably do differently, even though retrospectively, it probably was a good thing that we started off small and then scaled up our testing. But while the apps grew and the ecosystem grew, there were more and more requirements. And we usually just built them into our infrastructure. But we didn't have a mechanism for teams to customize th this infrastructure. This led to a point where we suffered from high code complexity. It was hard to maintain. And some features couldn't be removed, but they weren't used anymore. The last thing I want to mention here is configuration. Our host site infrastructure was getting configuration from many different sources. So we had flags, system environment variables, and config files. And this made it very hard to track down bugs in the infrastructure itself. So about a year ago, our team sat down with app teams in Google, and we wanted to learn about, about the past and the future, and especially how the Android testing landscape had changed. And so what we came up with to solve some of the problems that came out of the discussion was Project Nitrogen. Project Nitrogen is our new unified testing platform, which we first talked about at I.O. this year, and which we will ship to you in 2019. Project Nitrogen is currently used by a small number of apps inside of Google. And we're slowly scaling it up to some of the biggest apps in the world. And the reason why we're doing this is simply because we want to battle test it first before we ship it to you. But the point being here is we want to give all this infrastructure that we use to run 10 billion tests to you. <clears throat> so Nitrogen solves many problems. But two of the key issues that we're trying to solve with Nitrogen is, first, we want to create a unified entry point 
into Android development. And secondly, we want you to enable to write tests with a unified API and move them between layers. If you think about Android testing today, it looks a little bit like this, right? You have tools on the left-hand side, such as Android Studio, Gradle. You have your CI server, and maybe even another build system, such as Bazel. On the other end of the spectrum, you have all the different runtimes that you want to run on. We call runtime device, uh, devices in Nitrogen. So you want to run your test on a simulated device, or a virtual or physical device, or even on a remote device that runs in a device lab, such as Firebase Test Lab. But in order to do so, you have many different entry points. And it looks a little bit like this. You have a different configuration for every tool. You have different roles. You have different tasks. And it just becomes a nightmare to maintain. And actually, what we see in Google is, because it's so hard to move from one to the other, they would skew towards one type of a test or another. So what we want to do with Nitrogen is we want to have a unified entry point. And Nitrogen itself is just a standalone binary, a standalone tool, which infrastructure developers can use to really customize their infrastructure. But obviously, there's also all these other developers who don't work on infrastructure and work on actual app code. For them, we want to provide integrations into all the tools on the left-hand side to make it easy to run tests. And at that point, if you have a single entry point and a unified test, it fits very well within your developer workflow, because you can do local, fast, iterative development on a simulated device. Then in pre-submit, before you actually submit your change, you can run on an emulator matrix. And lastly, in post-submit, you can run on a remote device, a physical device, in Firebase Test Lab. And that's really what we're trying to do with Nitrogen. Nitrogen allows you to run tests at scale. It is highly configurable. It was built with customization and extensibility in mind. You can execute unit and instrumentation tests. It vastly improves reporting and therefore debugging. And maybe one of the most exciting things is it ships with its own virtual device management solution that manages devices for you. <clears throat> and that's actually something I think a lot of people in the community have been asking for us for quite a while. So Nitrogen is cross-platform. And we really build it from the ground up with all the experience that we have uh, seven years in host side and device side infrastructure. It will support Mac, Windows, and Linux, and it's written in Kotlin. And we really build it in a way such that we hopefully, that it's hopefully going to be good for the next seven years. Nitrogen, as I was saying, is just a standalone tool. So it can be easily integrated into any build system. And we're working on integrations for Gradle, Bazel, and Bazel. We're adding sharding and parallel test execution. And continuous integration support will be there from the start. On the device side, we're initially planning to have support for at least simulated virtual and physical devices, as well as device labs such as Firebase Test Lab. And you can even add your custom devices if you have custom hardware. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the high-level architecture of Nitrogen. So Nitrogen is basically split into two parts. We have a host site infrastructure. That is all the, coast, uh, all the code that runs on a host. And we've done something new. We also have an on-device infrastructure, which basically means we've moved some of our infrastructure onto, onto the device, which is a much saner environment to reason about. And the device is also the main abstraction that we use in Nitrogen for different runtimes. So the host side runner is mostly responsible for finding a device for you, setting up the device for test execution, and then requesting a test run. It can be easily configured with a proto buffer 
configuration, and it allows you to customize things like the test executor and the whole test harness. To decouple the host from the device, we have a new orchestrator service. You can think of it as the brain of test execution that runs on a device. And it's responsible for discovery, filtering, and sorting, and execution. An orchestrator service is just a gRPC service that can be implemented by any device. And we, in fact, use gRPC to communicate between the host and the device, which does not give us performance and speed. It also gives us a lot of stability, and it allows us to stream test results back to the host in real time. We also have a lot of extension points. So we'll have host plugins that allow you to run code on a host. And we'll also have device plugins that allow you to run code on a device. So let's dive into each of these sections. As I mentioned before, we use a single proto configuration with a declarative set of protos. This allows you to define devices, your test fixtures, so you can define things like APKs that you want to install, data dependencies that you want to push on the device. And then you can declare your host and device plugins. We initially will have support for single device executors, parallel device executors to run on um, multiple devices in parallel. And we'll also have a new multi-device executor, which will allow you to do things like um, orchestrating a test run between a device and a device, or a device and a watch, which is something that we increasingly see as a requirement. The good news is, if you're just an app developer, you usually don't have to deal with any of this configuration because it's built in in the tool integration. But if you're an infrastructure developer, this is where it gets really interesting for you because you can customize every single bit of nitrogen. Let's talk a little bit about plugins. So host plugins are plugins that can execute code on the host. Plugins that we've already built are the Android plugin. They just encapsulate all the code that allows us to run Android tests on a device. We have a data plugin that allows us to stage data onto the device, or a fixer script plugin, which allows us to execute fixer scripts on a device. And you can have your custom plugins. Custom plugins can have their own configuration. And with host plugins, you can actually run before the test suite starts and after the test suite is finished. The reason why we do it this way is because we want to avoid the chattiness between the host and the device. If you look at the after all method, you will also get access to the whole test suite result, which is great if you want to do any post-processing of your test results. And you even can submit an edit request back to us if you want to attach new artifacts to the test suite result. Device plugins, on the other hand, like the name is saying, run, are running on an actual device which is a much more sane environment to reason about. And in fact, most of our host side code that we used to configure the device is now moved to the device with a device plugin. So plugins that we've already built are a lockhead plugin that gives you a scoped lockhead per test method, a screenshot plugin that takes screenshots in case your tests fail, or a permission plugin which is pretty awesome because you can now grant and revoke runtime permissions, which was not able before. And you can obviously also have your custom plugins. So the difference from a device plugin to a host plugin is that it runs on a device. But this allows us to do things like that. We can give you a callback before a single test method is executed and after it's finished. And this is great, because we can avoid all the chattiness between the host and the device. And it gives you a lot of control. And if you think about it, 
I don't know how you set up your test fixtures now, but usually you would basically use something like at before class or at before, at after, at after class. Or if you want something more reusable, you would probably reach for a JUnit rule or there are some things you can't do with these APIs. And then you have to have your custom runner. And I think the great thing about this is we give you a whole new way of writing uh, plugins that actually run on a device and allow you to execute code on it. So let's move on to execution. So as I was saying, we moved the execution to the actual device. And we created a whole new orchestrator service and protocol. What this does, it standardizes the communication between the host and the device. And it can be implemented by any device, which means if you have a custom device, you can implement the same protocol, and you can still integrate with the host site easily. On Android, the orchestrator service is implemented by the Android test orchestrator. And once you request a test run on the host, it will then go, discover all the tests, apply any filters and sorting that you want, and then it will do either isolated or batched test execution. It will also call all your device plugins, and it will stream results back in real time to the host. So the last thing, that I want to talk about is reporting. So with Nitrogen, we will give you unified and consistent reporting. As I'm sure many of you have seen this command at the top. What it does is it runs an instrumentation test from the command line. If you use the dash R option, which is verbose mode, you'll get an output like this. And as you can see, it's not very human readable. I would say. And it's also quite chatty, because this is just showing a single test. And this is showing a passing test. If it fails, the only thing that it gives you in addition is a stack trace. So there's not really a lot of information or actionable data here to why the test failed. With Nitrogen, we, wanna, we want to move to something like this, a structured data format which gives you access to the properties of the test case, the status of the test, and the list of artifacts that were collected during the test run. Things like screenshots, video, lockhead, and any custom artifacts that you add in your post-processing. Again, this will also be integrated in Android Studio, and we will surface this in the Android Studio UI if you run tests. The last thing before I wrap up, what I want to mention is we also have support for custom reports. So you can do things like JNIT XML or even your custom report that integrates better with your own infrastructure. And with that, I want to hand over to Vishal, who's going to talk about device management. All right. Thanks, Stefan. Running any kind of Android UI tests generally happens on devices. There are two different device types where you could run your test, either on a physical device or a virtual device. Regardless of which device type you run your test on, it, each of them has its own sets of pros and cons. Let's just do a quick show of hands. How many people around here have had set up something like this, you know, testing on physical devices? <laughs> Looks like quite a few. A follow-up question. How easy was it to manage them? Hard? Yeah? Another follow-up question. Did you ever end up using a fire extinguisher next to it? <laughs> I seriously hope not. I have a funny story to share that happened a few years ago at Google when one of the teams decided that they wanted to test their stuff on physical devices. They procured a bunch of devices, glued them onto the wall, and, and integrated it with their CI infrastructure. Everything was running reasonably well until one fine day when the engineers came back to work on a Monday morning and things were timing out. If you were to guess, what went wrong? What would your guess look like? <laughs> OK. So it turned out to be an air conditioner problem. 
So what apparently happened was uh, the air conditioners in the building in San Francisco went bad. Uh, and because the air conditioners went bad, the facilities decided that they want to switch off the air conditioners so that they could fix it. But tests were continuously running on those devices, and the heat produced in those devices caused the glue to peel off from the, from the wall, and all the devices fell off to the ground. <laughs> Managing physical devices are hard. I just want to give out a huge shout out to the Firebase Test Lab team that makes testing on Firebase Test Lab so much easier for you folks. How do we solve this at Google? At Google? we use the virtual device infrastructure. The test environment that we use is extremely stable. The number that you look at the right is the stability ratio of our test environment. And that's right, it's 99.9999%. The continuous integration, in, uh, the virtual device infrastructure that we use uh, has the ability to run locally or in a CI environment. And it supports over 500 different device configurations. Let's dig in a little deeper to see what, what is its current state at Google. It's used by over 100 first-party apps, such as Google Photos, Search, YouTube, and so on and so forth. Uh, just in 2018, it had a staggering 2.4 billion invocations, and that number is growing year over year. There are over 120,000 targets that use this infrastructure. Having a great test infrastructure is a must if you want to release high-quality apps. You'd be thinking, this is great infrastructure. How does this fit in with nitrogen? If you remember uh, from slides that uh, Stefan presented a little bit earlier, Nitrogen has this concept of device providers. So if you want to run a UI test, you would invoke Nitrogen. Nitrogen, in turn, would invoke a device provider, which in this case is going to be the virtual device provider, which launches a device, does a bunch of smart setup, returns the control back to Nitrogen, which, act which actually goes and executes the test. And once the test is done, it goes and tears down the device. So in that case, you get a completely stable environment, which, which is launched by Nitrogen, runs the test, and shuts it down. So wh while designing this particular infrastructure, there were four key things that we kept in mind. The, the virtual device infrastructure needs to be simple to use, needs to be extremely stable. We should be, uh, it should be reproducible regardless of which environment it runs in, whether you're running it locally or whether you're running it in your CI infrastructure. And it needs to be extremely fast. Let's dig in into a little deeper as to how did we achieve each of these four goals in building a virtual device management solution. So uh, the, the virtual device infrastructure uh, has a very simple proto configuration. What does that mean? It's just a configuration file where you could go and add the characteristics of the device. For example, what's the horizontal screen resolution? What's the vertical screen resolution? What's the memory of the device? So for each of these different device types, like Nexus and Pixel, uh, the virtual device management solution already has pre-baked in all of these different device configurations. So you don't have to go and figure out the different device resolutions for each of those devices. It supports over 500 different device configurations. And because it's a configuration file, it's a matter of just adding or removing the uh, changes to the configuration file. And it supports several different form factors, such as phones, tablets, TV devices, and wear devices. But how is it simple? Uh, Launching it is as simple as calling the virtual device binary and specifying the name of the device. So if you want to launch a Pixel 2, you just say virtual device, device equals Pixel 2, and on what API level. You don't have to worry about uh, creating AVDs, specifying configurations, and things like that. That makes things extremely simple. Stability. This is probably one of the biggest problems most of the Android app developers face. Like, you're running your test, and an ANR pops up. And that ANR might not even necessarily be the app that you're testing. We had the same problem internally as well. All right, how did we solve this? Um, well, sorry. Android has a nifty service called as Activity Controller that lets you suppress ANRs whenever it sees them. This is the exact same uh, service that Android Monkey uses while it runs monkey tests. This increased our stability of our test tremendously. Like one of the things that I forgot to say, when we started with this particular infrastructure, uh, our stability was around 95%. But that's no good when you're running things at scale. So the first thing that we saw were ANRs. And once we fixed that, our stability increased, but still not to the level that we wanted. The next flaky things that we saw was we boot up a device, but the screen is not unlocked. And if the screen is not unlocked, all the key events that you inject does not even reach your app. And if the key events don't reach your app, your app is actually not getting tested, and your test is starting to fail. And it turned out when the device boots up, the screen is not uh, locked. So in, the screen is not unlocked. 
In API level 23, I believe, Android added an API for our, for our window manager where you could dismiss the key guard, and that would unlock the screen. So every time we booted the device, we would call the window manager API to unlock the screen. And this increased our stability furthermore. A few years ago, Android changed the file system from YAFFS, which meant yet another flash file system, to ext4. This was a great improvement, but it had its own set of problems. ext4 was, known, was prone to disk corruption during a hard shutdown. So whenever we would shut down the device, if it was not correctly shut down and it had disk errors, your subsequent boot of the virtual device would fail, leading to test flakiness. How did we solve this problem? Well, all we had to do was call in FSEC to the disk image that was unmounted, and this kind of guaranteed that when the disk was unmounted, it had no disk errors, and if there were no disk errors, your subsequent boot would come up just fine. This increased the stability of our uh, test environment to close to 99%, but that's still no good. When you're running at 2.4 billion invocations, a one-person failure is 24 million. And that's still a huge number. As you can see, there were a bunch of optimizations that we did to increase the stability. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but there's one final thing that I want to talk about. We would launch the device, but for, and uh, the virtual device would set a boot property saying that the device is completely booted up. But for whatever reasons, the launcher would not kick in. Now, so how did we solve that problem? Well, all we had to do was send out an intent to the launcher. Uh, if it was already launched, then it was a no-op. If, if it wasn't launched, then it started the launcher, and then we would return the control back to Nitrogen, which would then go and uh, run the test. Doing a bunch of optimizations like this helped us get to 99.9999% stability. The next big pillar the next big pillar that we had in mind was reproducibility. So a lot of times when users were running their tests in CI environment, if their test failed for whatever reasons, they had no way of debugging it locally. So our, the virtual device environment that we built uh, had to make sure that the environment was reproducible regardless of where they are running. So the virtual device management solution helps you launch things locally or on the cloud. And one of the big the big things about this environment is the device starts in a clean, pristine state for every invocation. So there is no state carry forward between different invocations, making sure like tests are going to be extremely stable and not fail because of the device itself. And our shell. There are several teams within Google that write NDK code, like when you're writing native code, and they wanted to test their native code. But to test their native code, they wanted to boot up ARM devices. And booting up ARM devices were extremely slow. For example, on Nougat, booting up an ARM device takes about 10 minutes. And this was slowing teams down tremendously. This, helped, this made us go back to the drawing board to see what could we do to, increase the, to decrease the time it takes to boot up those devices. So we ended up going and created a mini boot mode in the virtual device. What does mini boot mode mean? We, like For testing native code, you don't need the entire Android stack to be up and running. All you need is technically the Linux kernel. And if the kernel is up and running, you could test your native APIs. So we ended up, and, uh, we ended up adding a mini boot mode to our virtual device launcher, which would come up in less than 30 seconds. And that would uh, help the, the NDK developers to test their native code much more quickly. At Google, we make a lot of data-driven decisions. So because we were running things at scale, we were looking where we were spending bulk of our time while running our test. And it turned out 50% of our time was spent in booting up the emulator. 30% of the time was spent in installing an app because of a process called as text 2 uh, And 20% of the time was spent in running the test itself. Android made a change bet uh, between Lollipop and, and Nougat, where they wanted to do ahead of time compilation using a tool called as text 2 and so, what we, so because the app installation times were so huge, uh, what we ended up doing was you have the exact same device, the exact same app under test that's being tested, and the exact same dex to out file, that, the exact same out file being generated for every test invocation. What we said was, what if, if we move this as a single uh, action as a, on, a, on the basal build graph and reuse the out file that was generated for all your test runs? This significantly reduced the app install time from over three minutes for one of the apps to under a minute. If you were here earlier today when the emulator team presented about snapshots, where you could boot up an emulator, 
save the snapshot, and then shut down the emulator. And when you restart it, it restarts back from the same state. Well, we integrated the snapshot feature back into Virtual Device Launcher, uh, where you boot up a device, take a snapshot, uh, shut it down, and then reuse it when the test actually runs. This significantly reduced our test run times by over 30%. Just imagine, when you run tests at 2.4 billion invocations, reducing test times by 30% would yield a huge number of, like, you would you'd save huge amounts of CPU resources. One of the other features that we are going to work uh, pro probably next year is Cloud Snapshots, which is a combination of text to on the cloud and snapshots called Cloud Snapshots. With this, we come to our end of our talk, where with Nitrogen, you'd be able to run your test at scale in a completely stable environment with all of these different pillars. This is our next generation platform that would help you test. In this talk, we did do a lot of technical stuff like deck stump, FSEC, activity controller. You don't have to worry about any of those things, because all of these things are already incorporated in Nitrogen as well as the virtual device management solution. And all you would have to do is like use this. Uh, so we are hoping to release Nitrogen uh, Alpha in Q1 of next year. Uh, the virtual device management solution is going to be released around the same time as well with an alpha release. Firebase Test Lab is actually integrating with Nitrogen as well to run your tests. Um, one of the things that Stefan pointed out earlier about integration of Ni Android Studio and Gradle with Nitrogen. Uh, just imagine you're sitting in front of your Android Studio, you hit the Run Test button, which actually invokes Nitrogen, which could actually launch the virtual device, run your test, and give you results back on your Android Studio itself. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Is that it? All right. Well, hey, everyone. Um, I wanted to thank you all for coming and attending the Android Dev Summit. It is uh, really, really amazing to be able to do this again. We really want to know what you think, and this is really important. So all of you should, by now or very soon, will get a survey in your inbox. Please, please, please fill it out, because it is, we, we so much wanted to make this event amazing. Should we ever do it again? Uh, we really want to know uh, what worked and what didn't work, what, what you liked, what you didn't like. Less Dan Galpin, maybe, you know. Um, second thing is um, uh, we, are gonna, we have these QR codes, which we might be able to put up one more time, hopefully. Um, and um, th these are how you rate the sessions. And so we want to know what sessions you loved, what sessions you only liked, what sessions you sat through because they were there in the same room and you were, were kind of comfortable in your seat. Um, so please also fill out these surveys and let us know what worked. I know it's a lot of work, but I really appreciate that. And uh, ultimately, if you missed anything, all of these talks are actually up today, well, right now, okay, well, I guess that's gone. Um, all the talks that we have are up on the Android Developers YouTube channel. And, uh, and so again, I think and, uh, from yesterday and most of them from today are already going up. Uh, and by, I think, the end of tonight, all of them will be up on the channel. So you'll be able to even go home tonight. If you haven't had enough Android Dev Summit by now, uh, you can even have more from the comfort of your very own history museum. Um, and, uh, and finally, we have a little bit of a final reel here um, of just some of what was going on here that we'll, we'll, ha we sh we'll share to you as, uh, as you think about uh, wandering out here and going back to the real world. So thank you so much for coming again. Welcome to the 2018 Android Developer Summit. This is an event for developers by developers. With over two billion devices, three quarters of a trillion apps downloaded every year. Android's developer community is growing hugely. We saw it more than double just in the past few years. So the Android app bundle makes it much simpler. With no additional developer work needed, the App Bundle now makes apps an average of 8% smaller to download for M Plus devices. We simply could not do this without you, so thank you.